So that leads us to the main question, how do you get mergers of such massive black holes? Remember that the black holes that we're seeing merging, here's an artist's impression of an artist's impression, a simulation of what two merging black holes would look like, looking at the gravitational lensing of the background environment. You don't really see the black holes themselves, all you see is a distortion of the light from behind. So while you're hypnotized by this, here we have two black holes merging. How did they get so massive? We're talking about merging 20 to 50 solar mass black holes, whereas the biggest in our galaxy are more like 50 to 20 solar masses. How do you produce such enormous black holes and have them merge? Well, the obvious way is to have a really massive pair of stars, binary stars, and when they die, turn into a really massive pair of black holes, which then at some point merge as they radiate away their orbital energy. Are there massive enough stars to produce such enormous black holes? Well, there are. I mean, this is one of the most massive stars known in our own Milky Way galaxy. It's a binary system with 152 solar mass and 46 solar masses. So those are comfortably more than the mass of the black holes we need. So that sounds okay. There are big enough stars. Surely when they die, they will produce big enough black holes, which can then merge and produce what we see. But, 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 but there's a bit of a problem. When you actually look at really massive stars, and they're extremely rare, here is the nearest and best known of these extremely massive stars. This is Eta Carina, and it consists of probably roughly a 150 solar mass star with a binary companion between 30 and 80 solar masses. And this is what it actually looks like. You can barely see the stars at all. They're surrounded by such a huge cloud of gas and dust. That's why the masses are so uncertain, because basically you can't see what's in the middle because of this huge cocoon of dust and gas around it. And this turns out to be absolutely typical of very massive stars in our own galaxy. They're all surrounded by enormous clouds of dust and gas, which first of all makes them hard to study. But it also is a clue for why you don't normally find very massive black holes in our own Milky Way. Here's what's going on. A massive star, like any other sort of star, um, sits there burning hydrogen to form helium in the middle, usually a reaction catalyzed by carbon, nitrogen, oxygen called the CNO cycle. And so the central little bit of the star is burning nuclear fusion, whereas the bulk of the star is just sitting there as an incredibly thick and heavy blanket squashing down that middle bit. And there's not normally much swapping of material between the middle bit and the outer bit. There is some convection in the middle, but it doesn't go very far into the non-burning region outside. So this stuff remains pristine hydrogen, whereas the middle bit is getting denser and denser and producing more and more helium. Now eventually in the middle it's going to get really dense and be mostly helium, so there can't be any more nuclear fusion. And at that point, we'll start getting shell burning. We'll now get helium burning in the centre and a shell of hydrogen burning further out and still a bunch of non-burning gas further outside. And this outside region will become much larger and cooler and redder and this is when it turns into some sort of red supergiant. But as time goes on, you'll get more and more. You'll, you'll start running out of helium in the middle and you'll start burning even heavier elements. This is a diagram showing time before collapse as goes to the mass and it's showing the different elements being produced at different radii inside. What you basically get is a whole series of shells. So you might get a hydrogen burning shell, then a helium burning, then a carbon, then a neon, an oxygen, even silicon burning shells right in the middle which produce the heavy elements that are in your body and your computer and everything else. Now the trouble is when this is all going on you've got an incredible amount of radiation flooding out from the centre. It actually burns in the middle faster than you'd think. It's so hot in the middle of these things that you're producing spontaneous quantum mechanical pairs of particles and antiparticles. A photon of light goes along and produces an electron-positron pair, which then normally annihilates back together again and forms another positron. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it produces neutrinos, and these neutrinos, being the closest thing to non-existent of any particle, can escape. So what you're getting now is a huge flood of neutrinos pouring out from the centre of these stars and carrying energy away. You might think that carrying energy away make it cooler, but in fact it makes it burn faster. 
Normally, when a star burns, it's self-regulating. If it burns too fast, it gets too hot, which causes the inner regions to swell up, become less dense, and so there's not so much nuclear fusion. But here, the heat is a lot of it's leaking away neutrinos, which means it can burn incredibly fast. So these later stages, these burning things, can, might only take you days or even hours. It gets through them very fast, enormous luminosity. And there is a problem, because this enormous luminosity, some can be out of neutrinos, but a lot of it's coming out of normal radiation. And this cool outer envelope of the star has lots of dust grains in them. And yet all this radiation trying to get its way through the dust grains, and it tends to push the dust grains out the way. And so you tend to blow away a very large fraction of the mass of the star. Maybe 70, 80, 90 percent of the mass of the star gets blown away. That's why you see these huge clouds. In the case of Eta Carina, it's probably already blown about 30 solar masses away, and who knows how much more it's going to blow away before it actually finally explodes. What you tend to get left with is all this envelope at the outside has been blown away, and you're just left with the core, the, the burning core in the middle. And these show up as what are called wolf Rayet stars. And here's a pretty example of one of these things. So that's a wolf Rayet star. The star has blown away all its outer envelope, and you're now seeing the naked core surrounded by the huge amount of mass that's been blown out. And this is thought to be why you don't get very massive black holes in our Milky Way galaxy. It's because when you get a really massive star, you do get the really massive stars, but before they get to that final collapse phase, when they can collapse and form a black hole, they go through this wind phase. And in the wind phase, they blow away so much mass, there's not much left at the end to form your really massive black hole. That's why most black holes we know about in the Milky Way, before gravity waves, were only like five or ten solar masses. In the final collapse phase, uh, we've already talked about core collapse supernovae, and it's similar to that. Energy runs out, everything starts piling in towards the middle, but instead of forming a neutron star and bouncing, producing an explosion, it goes straight into a black hole, and it's probably rather underwhelming, it probably just disappears. Which is why you don't see those in your supernova surveys, it all just disappears, all the energy is swallowed up in the black hole in the middle. So that's the theory. But how can we be detecting such big black hole binaries with gravity waves? How can we get black holes so much bigger? Well, we don't know, but there's a few possibilities. One possibility is that these are occurring in environments with a low metallicity. Now, low metallicity to an astronomer means not many metals, and to an astronomer, not many metals means not many elements other than hydrogen and helium. Yes, I know, we're weird. Remember that this wind that blows away most of the mass and leaves you with only a small runt of a star at the end is produced by radiation pushing on dust grains, and dust grains are made of heavy elements. So if you don't have many heavy elements, you're not going to have much dust, and maybe the star's not going to lose so much of its mass. So it could be that these binary black holes we're seeing are occurring in low metallicity environments. The nearest to these is imaginary clouds, and in this you do indeed see clusters of incredibly luminous, massive stars. Um, you do seem to get more massive stars in these low metallicity environments, and they don't lose as much mass probably from winds as they do in our Milky Way, where there are more heavy elements. So that's one possibility. You actually wouldn't get these massive black holes in our own Milky Way. You will get them in environments like dwarf galaxies, where there's not the same concentration of heavy elements. Another theory is that, in fact, all our idea about the winds being blown out assumed that the star was stratified. So you had the inner bits burning, burning the heavier elements, and the outer bit is not being chemically processed. And that's because there's not much convection to mix it up. But it could be that some of these really massive stars, particularly the binary ones, are being stirred up. They're spinning really fast and their mutual gravity is pulling on each other. And that means that all the heavy elements produced in the middle get mixed out to the outer envelope, and the nice pristine hydrogen and helium from outside gets mixed into the middle. This would be a bit like uh, trying to cook uh, I don't know, an omelette or a scrambled egg or soup or something like that. If there's no convection, no stirring, you burn at the bottom and the top remains raw. But if you're stirring the whole time, then the whole thing heats up. So that's the idea. Maybe these stars are spinning so fast that they get very well mixed, and instead of the middle burning and starting, starting to go into higher and higher shells of burning heavier elements, 
the whole star mix is carrying new hydrogen in, and so it won't start burning heavy elements until the entire star has processed the early elements. And if this is the case, the star might never swell up to be the red giant, it might never have much of a wind. It always stays hot and blue, just steadily mixing everything up and burning the whole thing through. It'll last longer, um, because there's more fuel to draw upon, and the whole star will be burning the same things at the same time, more or less. That's another possibility. So that might be how we get the massive black holes. How do we get them close enough they merge? We have to get them close enough that they can radiate away energy. As they radiate away to energy, that uh, allows them to spiral closer and closer until we get our chirp and detect it. But most binaries aren't that close. So one possibility for how you get them that close is what's called common envelope evolution. Here's a binary star. We've got number one and number two. And number one comes to the end of its life and swells up and overflows its Roche lobe, as we talked about earlier, starts dumping gas on number two. Number two then swells up. And now if both these stars are massive and they're both swelling up, you can get, instead of mass falling from one to the other, you can end up with both the cores orbiting in a huge hamburger-shaped, bigger, common envelope. So you've actually got two star cores inside what might look like from the outside, one star. Here's a simulation of this from Allman's paper from 2016. And if you're in a star like that, the interaction between the cores and all the gas around them the, will cause them to spiral closer together. So it could be you won't just see the two black holes, you'll actually be apparently inside what looks like a single star, and it's the interactions between the cores and the star that brings them really close together. Another possibility is that it's all happening in star clusters. Here are some star clusters, and here's a globular cluster. Now if black holes form in these, they'll probably settle down in the centre because there's constant dance of one star passing another one in their mutual gravitational pull, and that will cause the heavy things to move towards the centre and the lighter ones to move outside. And so the middle of some of these clusters might well have dense clusters of neutron stars and black holes, dense heavy things that have settled right down the middle in the deepest gravitational potential. And it could be that when they get close together, they start merging. Uh, often these mergers will f result in one or other of the black hole components being flung out of the cluster, but sometimes, especially if it's a triple merger, uh, one can get flung out and the other two can get closer and closer together. So it could be that what we're actually seeing is the merger of black holes in dense clusters of this, where the darts of stars traipsing around each other in the dense cluster at the middle produces the massive black holes and causes them to get close enough that they will merge. Those are the more conventional theories. There are also some more way out theories. For example, it could be that primordial black holes are created shortly after the Big Bang and are still going around. And that's where they've come from. Another theory is that black holes are actually formed in disks around quasars. We don't really know.